country is obsessed with gangsters at a time when we should probably more, be more concerned with banksters. Um, some dude in a uh, some dude in a clan lab in South Auckland is hardly responsible for the collapse of the international monetary system, and there've been more metaphoric handbags ripped off little old ladies by the likes of uh, Bridgecorp and Blue Chip uh, than all the crims in Monaco combined. Yet the uh, Maori gangs are our social devils and the focus of our moral panic. This is a, an implicit principle, I think, that has been referenced more than once today already, and that is that we must internalize the harms caused by our regulatory system in our analysis of drug-related harm. Drug control policies can and do cause significant harm. And our concern should be the net harm, the harm of drugs plus the regulatory harm when we try and measure the efficacy of a drug control system, a system that brings zero use of drugs but carries the kind of social consequences that prohibition is now carrying is a failed system. Firstly, the laws are inefficient. The great majority of users, and if you've got 80% of users, you should get quite a few people in court. We actually don't. Only a very small minority get arrested. <coughs> the way they get arrested is secondary to other crime and other investigations. The process is discriminating since certain groups, notably, notably male and Maori, get arrested at a far higher rate than female and non-Maori who are consuming exactly the same number of joints per week. So you've got to be in the right group to get caught. And finally, they're ineffective. We actually followed people up after conviction, and there was absolutely no change in the behavior. If you actually looked at that as a therapeutic treatment, it misses most people, it's discriminatory, and has no effect. You would really not be prescribing this for your patients, would you? Police spend hours, weeks, months gathering local information, which assists us to seize illicit drugs. Uh, locate offenders and uncover our drug laboratories. Uh, we've created over a number of years specialist uh, uh, police units to try, to try and contribute to reducing supply. The National Clandestine Laboratory uh, response teams, the Clan Lab teams, uh, support all police districts to locate and uh, dismantle Clan Labs. Uh, these terms, teams in turn are supported by uh, intelligence analysts who work to identify offenders who purchased uh, many of the precursors involved in these laboratories. I think there's a general point to be made here, which is that we easily overestimate the effects of policies on actual behavior. And this is an area where uh, um, uh, it seems as if the, what goes on out there on the street among young people is rather little affected by the, um, by the nature of the uh, criminal regime that's supposed to be deterring it. The issue of arrest conviction, incarceration, post-conviction sanctions are very, very different depending upon what your race is, what your age is, and what your economic status is. And we don't really talk about that that much. And you would think that if the goal was to have some justice and fairness, then the people that you should punish the most are the ones who are richest the ones who have the most resources, the ones who theoretically have the less justification for breaking the law and misusing drugs. But no matter where you go in the world, that's not the case. And proportionality has two basic aspects. Are the enforcement activities you're pursuing proportionate to the objective you're trying to achieve? Um, and uh, as, 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 as you've uh, heard me say before, there are certain instances around the world where uh, it's hard to justify that the level of enforcement is uh, proportionate according to the objective. The second ever is the extent of punishment. Is the extent of punishment proportionate to the offense? And we have the absurd situation in many countries around the world where people receive greater punishment for their own choice of what they decide to ingest uh, than you would get for, my, uh, for very violent or uh, very serious uh, uh, criminal offences. Just let me say that there's no war on drugs in New Zealand any more than there is a war on violence. There is, however, policing of drug-related crime, and such activity can make a real difference, not only to supply but targeting supply 
and also demand. It's not a black and white question. We don't have to decide whether it's just ta tackle supply or just tackle demand. Clearly the inclination of individual users to seek substances of abuse can be reduced in some cases through education and treatment. But equally, we must engage in serious and effective policing of drug supply because demand reduction can only ever make a small impact. And it's simply not true to say that those who are involved in use but also dealing to support their addiction or because they're part of a drug milieu don't get substantial prison terms. They do. In fact, they're the majority of offenders who are getting substantial prison terms. Uh, and it seems to me it's that group that we need to start thinking about because it's that group that the system is probably completely ineffective for and it's that group that we have no reason to believe deterrent punishments work for. And in my view, the whole issue of public security enforcement is a subset of the justice question. First you look at how the, what the health issues are around all, any and all drug use all drug use, regardless of whether it's legal status. Then you look at the justice questions of how best to manage um, the population in a justice context, and then you deal with any enforcement or public security issues as a subset of that. If at the moment, um, the whole globe really is obsessed with the other way around, where public security enforcement punishment is the number one priority when dealing with um, issues around drug use. I do a lot of talks as well about prisons in Australia and, and my point is that it should be the last resort. It should be the thing we do last with people because it is not a place we can actually help people. Uh, and that's, I've worked in prisons, I know a lot of people who work in prisons, they try hard but the environment is just not the right place to do and I would much prefer people went into treatment unless we had no other option but to send them to prison. It's violent, it's intimidating, it's aggressive, male and female and we really shouldn't be sending people there unless we really have to. As important as it is for us to have a public health approach to addressing the problems of drugs, it's equally important, equally important to have a human rights focus on the way that we look at issues related to drugs and drug-related harms. Because the, to me, the limitation of public health is that it basically often keeps you looking at the macro effect of what's happening to society at large and allows you to ignore the things that are happening to particular subgroups within that society who may be getting hurt more than the overall society is being benefited. And if you have a set of policies that almost universally act to hurt those people in each society who are the most vulnerable, the weakest, the ones for whom the consequences of both drug use and addiction and drug policies are the worst, you would think that that would give you that much more incentive to change them because they're least able to withstand the effects.